basically, you know, we've got a whole lot of people in New Zealand out doing a whole lot of things that are really fun and sometimes quite dangerous. You know, it's our job to make sure that, you know, not only can they have fun, but also they can be rescued when they do get in trouble as well. We work with, like, really, really high safety margins. So even though, you know, might think, hey, jumping off a, a bridge is really high risk, if, if you still look at the engineering and, and the design behind that, you know, we're working on a one in a million problem. Welcome to a Kiwi Original. This is episode 17. And on today's show, I'm joined by Shane Rhodes, the Managing Director of Aspiring Safety based in Christchurch, who manufactures safety equipment that a number of different industries rely on when you're high up in the sky and roped into a harness and you want to make sure that you stay there so uh, thanks very much for being on the call and being featured on the show shane yeah no dramas ryan thanks for thanks for having me it's great to be here so tell me a little bit about uh, aspiring safety in terms of um, what are the industries that rely on the products that you make yeah we're um we're very diverse ryan and um we, we sort of, I mean, it's, and it's not all just about at heights. Um, we, we do things like traffic management um, harnesses and lanyards for guys on the back of trucks because, you know, it's actually a, a problem to fall off a truck. Um, mostly we're, we're in the adventure tourism industry, though, so we do a lot of the stuff that in, in New Zealand um, a lot of tourists come to basically have fun. So that's jumping off bridges, bungee and et cetera, zip lines. Um, and then we, we sort of, go through different um, industries as well on top of that. Um, we supply a lot of uh, people to clean windows, for example, on your skyscrapers. Um, the guys at Fonterra to upsell onto milk vats to repair those. Um, the guys at, at Meatworks to um, keep themselves on the line and not go over the edge, again, just like a traffic management um, truck. So, you know, there's the, the fun stuff, the, the caving, the canyoning, the, the rock climbing, etc. cetera. We, we do that as well on the recreational side and um and yeah we um everything through is, as well as search and rescue is, is the other one big one for us so we do a lot of work with the rescue helicopter guys um the police lancer up on cliff rescue um basically you know we've got a whole lot of people in new zealand out doing a whole lot of things that are really fun and sometimes quite dangerous and uh you know it's our job to make sure that you know not only can they have fun but also they can be rescued when they do get in trouble as well so yeah. So your product is a, a bit of a, a risk mitigator for uh, either businesses or people who are doing things that are just slightly off the norm of, of walking to your supermarket or walking to your shops. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we work with like really, really high safety margins. Um, and and we back up those safety margins. So even though you know might think, hey, jumping off a, a bridge is really high risk. If, if you still look at the engineering and, and the design behind that, you know, we're working on a one in a million problem, for example, that could occur. And if we back that up with another system, that'll be one in a million as well. So, you know, you, you, you've sort of got all these factors that are, that are coming together in terms of the gear that we make, that we put out there um, to keep people safe. Um, you know, there, there is the, the slight problem of it we rely on, on human error. Um, and that gear has to be used properly in the, in the proper way to be effective. Um, but essentially, if it is and it's all in the right place, then um, you know what you're doing is, is safer than you think. Um, it's safe as going you know, crossing the road to go to the supermarket. Um, but you know, it's um, I suppose it's easy to say. But you know, when you stand on the top of a bridge and someone says jump off, um, you've got to, like my customers say, trust the equipment. Right, because um, they're literally yeah. putting their lives into oh, the true, hands yeah. of the products you're making. What are some of the, the things that you and your team have to consider during the making process when you're getting in yarns or uh, components or um, shackles? Yeah, or yeah. Like, What are all the different elements that, that gives you the confidence that when you ship a product that it is going to be one in a million or one in a million times one in a million? Yeah, that's... Um it's a good question. There's a lot of a lot of different components that go into a lot of different products, and and they react differently in, in different ways. So yeah, we, we're constantly thinking about the fabrics we're using and, and what we want them to achieve. Um, you know, we dif- I suppose like all industries, you know, there's different things for for different different products that, that, that make them work, um, and you can't just take one one and equal two. You know, there's, there's all these different factors. So we often think about the worst case scenario when when we're when we're designing things and we're doing it and we're thinking, 
how do we mitigate that to make it as safe as possible? So if the worst case scenario does happen, is, is, is the, basically is it strong enough to still hold? And that's kind of where we like to get to. So we use you know a variety of, of different methods to, to achieve that. Um, we, we look at different standards for different products. Um, we don't only actually like to meet standards. We, we sort of have the aspiring standard and, and the normal standard, and the aspiring standard is, is well above that. Um, so essentially we meet a standard, then we work out how can we make it better. Um, we then make it better, and then we put it to market. So um, that's kind of you know our, our little point of difference, I suppose, is that we're not just focused on how can we make this as cheap as possible and, and flick it out the door, but how can we make this as foolproof as, as we can. So, I think that's yeah, a, an yeah. important distinction too when you've got a, a product that there's many companies around the world can manufacture in their own home country. How do you mm-hmm. differentiate what the New Zealand version stands for and you know the name aspiring safety aspiring um, is an iconic image of New Zealand given now you know mount aspiring um, mm-hmm. Correct, yeah. talk me through your decision to get involved with aspiring safety and then um, the acquisition of the business in 2015 what what uh, attracted you to this business yeah so I I was I suppose like a, a lot of people I was a little bit bored for lack of a better word, in, in the corporate world. Um, not that I've got against any, any other parts of, of New Zealand, but the only place for me to expand my, my corporate life was to go to Auckland, for instance. And I thought, I sort of thought, well, I want to get off this and I want to own my own business because I've dealt with a lot of small business owners over the years and, you know, they look like they have fun, it looks easy, <laughs> they call their own shops, you know. Like, yeah, the, the free life, what, what, the easy life, what, right? Yeah, the, yeah, the easy life. So, so you know, what, what can go wrong? So, um, so I looked at a variety of different businesses. I, I casted the net very wide. Um, I came across Aspiring sort of initially in, in my in my just sort of discovery phase, I suppose you call it. Um, and I sort of dug a little bit deeper into the company, and I thought, hmm, that's quite technical. That sounds really, really hard. Um, maybe that's not me. So I sort of moved on to a few other businesses. But then this Aspiring just sort of just sat in the background. So I came and I, I met Lindsay, the owner. Um, at the time, and you know, we, we had a good sort of frank discussion, and 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 he gave me a warts and all sort of story of of this business. He, he, he told me all the problems. Um, so I sort of thought, well, you know what? That's that's someone I can trust. That's someone I can buy a business off. So the more we talked, the more we learned about the story. The more I thought, well, this is a New Zealand made manufacturer. So we're making the only we're the only ones in Australasia making what we make. Um, that's a really cool story. Um, this business was was sort of, I suppose, like a lot of a lot of businesses was started by one person. You know, it was their hobby, it was their passion. It was it was whittled away over thirty years. There was, there was no real sales and marketing going on. You know, we we just did what was what was good, and people sort of bought that. And, you know, so we had a really great base. And I was, and just, I just kept ticking boxes after box. So initially, after nine months of of discussing and um, and weighing out things, I thought, well, here we go. So um, so yeah, I purchased the business off Lindsay. Um, I took the great step, which I'd probably recommend to a lot of people if you get into a technical business of, of hiring hiring him for a year. And, you know, through the, the process of osmosis and um, just picking stuff up, we um, transferred all the knowledge, you know, I wouldn't say all the knowledge, but most of the knowledge that was in his head to my head. Didn't make any changes over that year, just let the business run. And then, um, and then yeah, Lindsay retired after that, and um, I've been on my own now for the last three and a half years. And, um, and yeah, right in this... Uh, this great venture and um you know we've, we've got a brand that um like i say it, it was established um and now we just just want to take it to that, that sort of next step so that's what the last three years has sort of been about and um what the next 10 years are going to be about in the future um we often have, have people that come in that say i've never heard of you before and it's like that's great because neither of my competitors <laughs> so we've been sort of you know, sitting in this, in this little space, doing what we do and doing it great, and we're really well went on in some areas and not so much in, in others. Um, and you know, the challenge moving forward, I suppose, for us is is to get that name out there and get that story out there even further. Um, so yeah, we're, uh, I think what um, resonated with me there was the uh, that call you made to keep the previous founder on for a year because that. It, it gives you a, a someone to fall back on, but it also actually is quite a big call because 
uh, in terms of managing the team, you had to have the humility there to take over the business, but not potentially taking over all the ways of working that you wanted to implement mm. straight away. So how did you balance that between wanting to shift the culture and move things forward, but at the same time uh, wanting to do the knowledge transfer without uh, upsetting your organization? Yeah, I, um, I, I don't know exactly why I did it, but I just made myself a goal at the start that I would not change anything in a year. I figured but you, you're buying a business, you're buying it for a reason. Um, the reason you're buying it is a successful business. Before you know what the, what the heck you're doing, don't don't go in and stuff it up. Don't you know? The worst thing I could have done here is, is come in and made changes on day dot. Um, you know, there were changes during that year that I thought we should have made, and um, we could have. But I held held true to that. Um, and yeah, you have to, um, I suppose, yeah, humility and um, just basically, yeah. Um, it's a I smart way of doing it. There's a little bit of common sense as well, you know. Yeah. Um, well, it's it's you know, common sense for you. It's not necessarily the the norm. Uh, too many times mm-hmm. I see signs at the front of successful businesses saying under new management, and that's really mm-hmm. a billboard to your existing customers to say, should I continue coming here? Mm-hmm. And it, it's high mm-hmm. risk. So I, th- I think you did really well to just fly under the radar, do the knowledge transfer. Uh, after that first twelve months, what did you then? Um, what were the things that you were ready to implement? So between twenty mid twenty sixteen to now, we're at kind of coming into mid twenty twenty. So you've had four years running yep. it yourself. What changes have you made, and what you know, how has that resulted for your business? Yeah, so the the first big one I um, I did was I I implemented the ISO nine thousand and one um, quality system. Um, that was something that initially looked completely daunting. Um, you know, from a person who hadn't come from manufacturing. Um, to now come into a business and say, how do I implement a 9001 system? Um, <laughs> it's not easy. Um, but I sort of viewed that as, as that credibility that our business needed to, to move forward. And um, that took a lot of changes around here. It took a lot of, of different different thinking for the, pay, the way we work and, and the way people worked. Um, you know, we, we had to put processes in. We had to make, make people do things. You know, we've, we've got staff members that have been here for 20 years. Um, and all of a sudden we're saying, well, hey, I know you've done it that way, but we, we need to do it this way. Um, you know, there weren't huge amounts of changes, but we had to document everything. We had to make sure we were dotting our I's, crossing our T's, and, and working that out. And that, that's had a, a really great effect on, like, not just our manufacturing process, but all, the rest of the business. So we've now got a, a you know, policies and procedures manual that is fantastic, that covers everything, um, you know, from, from sales to marketing to how we reconcile the accounts. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of set this business up that everyone now knows what they're doing, how they're doing it, and, and, and why they're doing it, um, which has created some some great efficiencies. So that was probably the, the biggest thing I, I changed. Um, we're still continually evolving with that. Uh, we get audited once a year on it. Um, so externally yeah, audited, independently externally validated, audited. Yep. that you're keeping yep, sticking yep. to your processes. Yep, yep, correct. Yep, yeah, we have an order to come in every year. Um, it's in January, so we've um, only just recently gone through that process. Um, so we have a, what's called a surveillance audit every year, where they come and make sure we're doing, doing that right. And we have a recertification audit, which is every three years, which is coming up in January this year. Um, so the great thing is, the last last three to four weeks, we've been stuck in lockdown, but we've been at home on our computers. We've been talking on Zoom. We've been refining our policies, refining our manual. Um, yeah, doing all those little things that are on the to-do list that we're always like, we'll get to that. We've we've sort of got like everything covered now, um, and you know that's that's really great. And I'm really proud of the team actually and, and how they've come together on that one. Um, a lot of it's been done without my input, um, and I've just been reviewing them as they come through. And um, yeah, it's um, it's been good. So um, so yeah, that was number one change. Um, the other biggest change is as we we bought this business because it was a wholesale and trade trade only business. Um, they didn't didn't operate retail. Didn't have prices on the website. Didn't have any marketing. Wow! Um, and that's in 2015. Well, that's in 2015. Yeah, that was, that was through to mid 2016. And then we thought, well, we're not doing much in Australia, so we built an Australian website and we we sort of turned the tap on in Australia and we started doing a little bit of um, social media and, and AdWords over there. And um, 
and that just went from strength to strength. Um, it now makes up fifteen percent of our business, um, over you know, and that's grown for the last three years. And that's direct to the consumer. It's, it's nice and easy. It's just website based, so it goes from there. So that gave us the the strength and the resolve to um, do the same to New Zealand, which we've, we've now done as well. So so now we run a wholesale, a trade, and a retail market um, in New Zealand and Australia. And they've all sort of come together and they work quite nicely with each other. Um, a lot of our products are getting out there now that that weren't before. Um, yeah. So, so what um, going through that process uh, because yeah. when you do yeah. launch online, I think this is something that a lot of people don't um, kind of recognise is that as a manufacturer, you have these really high trust relationships with either distributors or retailers, and yet you yeah. can see this opportunity to sell direct to consumers. How do you balance the potential channel conflict and, and what discussions do you need to have so yeah, that yeah. you're not upsetting the other 85% of your revenue? Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. That was the um, that was one of the hardest things I, I battled with, especially in New, uh, well, in New Zealand, actually, where we had a really good wholesale market. So I, um, I was lucky enough to be in the business mentor program two, two years ago. Um, and I had a really, really great mentor called David Bennett, who's a business coach here in Christchurch. And, and he said to me, well, Shane, what's the worst that's going to happen if you turn this on? Because can you turn it off again? And I went, I'd never thought of it that way. All I had thought about is, is the negative, you know. What if my wholesale customers say they don't like this and, and they, they disappear overnight? And, and he just challenged me on it. And I was just like, well, good point. So I came back to the office and we just we actually had it set up in the background. It was ready to go and we turned it on. Um, Again, never look back. Um, we had to have a couple of, of key discussions with a couple of, key, of our key wholesale customers and say, look, this is what we're doing and this is how we're doing it, um, just, you know, out of common courtesy and, and respect for them. Um, and they were fine with it because we, we have 2,200 different product lines here and, and not one of our wholesale markets even come close to stocking anywhere near that. So, you know, we, we were not getting the exposure we needed, so we had to do it and... Um, you know, we don't go out there and we don't compete directly with our customers. Um, but, you know, we, we are there and people come by off us direct and um, and it works well. And, and like I've, I've said to a, a few of them over the years, and the question has come up, is, is you know, the higher margins we make at retail uh, helping keep your wholesale costs where they are. So our wholesale costs of them have not moved in the last four years. And principally that's because our, our business is now balancing out and our profit margins are, are there. And, um, and yeah, we're, we're happy and they're happy and... Sorry to interrupt. This won't take long. Subscribe to the show and you'll never miss another one of these amazing episodes. Right back to the show. That's an interesting way to to position it actually because if you are getting a higher margin because you're selling direct to consumer, that then takes the pressure off having to sell volume at wholesale rates through the other channel. So actually, even if you are taking the odd sale, you're not necessarily uh, competing with your wholesale business. You're actually supporting them to operate at their their price point. Correct, and we're also, you know, we're also getting the brand out there more. We're getting, you know, there's, there's a lot more people using our products now, um, which again helps them and supports them in terms of on selling our gear. Um, and yeah, it's um, like I say, it's 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 worked out really well. We haven't had any issues with with our wholesale customers and. And in fact, our wholesale market has grown in the last three years. So, so who um, is the competitor then? If it's not the wholesalers to your direct to consumer channel, if that's all friendly, um, yep. who's the not necessarily the business, but what is the thing that you're always keeping in mind? Is it is it another safety company, or is it people just not doing recreation or uh, not using harnesses in industrial? Where's where's yeah, the pressure yeah. come from? Uh, the, the pressure pretty much comes comes from other other products and other brands. Um, so there's there's a lot of lot of imported products on the market. Um, a lot of the recreational and quite a lot of the industrial market is is driven by European products. Um, that's a lot to do with a bit of the wholesale and distribution market in New Zealand. Um, like I say, we're the only ones doing what we do in the recreational sense, um, and. In that market, you know, there's there's heaps of competitors we've got. So we're always mindful of, of price because imported products tend to be pretty low. Um, the great thing, the advantage we've got there is they generally come in via distributor and then to a wholes- well, you know, wholesaler distributor and 
and then retail. Um, so there's one less person in the supply chain. Um, but yeah, essentially we, we're competing um, on brand, I suppose, as well. Um, we do import products alongside our manufacturer products that support our business. They work quite well hand in hand. Um, yeah, it's, uh, um, you know, there's, if you need a harness, you need a harness. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, whether you buy it from, from us or from someone else. But yeah. How important is it to your business when a, a large company like a Fonterra chooses a New Zealand made safety harness versus an imported one? What, what does that allow you to do as a business? It, it allows us to, to, I suppose, keep doing what we're doing and keep developing and, um, and I suppose at the end of the day, keep, keep the 10 Kiwis employed that we've got here. Um, we, you know, I, I could name a lot of companies that don't use New Zealand made products that could. Um, and whilst that might say might disappoint me to a degree, I, it's kind of on my shoulders the fact that I need to go out there and see them and, and tell them why. Um, again, a lot of those people haven't heard of us. Um, but there are some companies, um, I can think one of the, the largest companies that this company dealt with when I took over is, is no longer a customer of ours um, and is owned by the New Zealand government. Um, that is, is one little bugbear that's, that's still on my mind, um, but they, to be fair, do operate in a space where we quite don't have the, I suppose, the capabilities in normal terms. Um, but moving forward, post-COVID-19 and um, looking for markets to expand back into, that's, that's one we're looking at, yeah. And I, and I think that's a, a good area to look at. I know that the uh, government procurement rules changed towards the end of last year to mm-hmm. assess uh, tenders on more than just price. So there's five uh, key criteria. Uh, one's on environment, uh, you know, what you're doing to uh, promote the environment, and others on community. So what does it yep, mean yep. If, if you get the business locally in that community versus someone that may not contribute locally? Um, Is there a Mm -hmm. cultural aspect to it? So do you employ um, for diversity? Do you employ for cultural initiatives? Uh, And then what I think is the most important one is total cost of ownership because it's very easy Mm -hmm. to put a cheap product in that then fails and you keep selling more product on a government tender. But if you've got a high quality product, you shouldn't be penalized because over the total lifespan, let's say five or 10 years, your product is actually the lowest cost but just not mm-hmm. with the initial investment. So I think there's some interesting things there. Are you plugged into the, the government procurement, um, the GETS tender system? I, yeah, I'm on the GETS system, um, and we have sort of dabbled our foot a little bit. But um, to be honest, most of it is in the industrial side, and we have been extremely busy in the last four years in the adventure tourism side. Um, now we've got a little bit of time to reflect and sort of look at where we can go. Um, we, we actually compete really well on price. Um, you know, especially in the industrial imported stuff from Europe, um, our products are, are as cheap, if not cheaper. Um, and the New Zealand made, and then you make the New Zealand standard, which is the other big thing, is a lot of the European products can only be made to the European standard. Um, we, we see here in New Zealand, we've got a, a fantastic industrial um, standard for harnesses. It's, it's one of the best in the world. It's a joint, joint standard with us in, in Australia. Um, it's got some pretty tough criteria to meet. Um, Hence why it's one of the best in the world. But, um, it does hamstring us a little in terms of we can only build harnesses with certain materials such as polyester. Uh, we can't use nylon because we have such a high UV factor in New Zealand that the UV, UV that affects nylon and it, and it doesn't affect polyester. The flip side of it is it doesn't get you as comfortable of a harness. So the problem we've got is, is the end user who's using it going, well, this is not as comfortable as my old harness. Yes, it's technically safer and better quality. So that's the challenge we face. Um, that's the challenge we face in that, that, that customer I was talking about, um, is that we're kind of, yeah, for lack of a better word, hamstrung by what we can and can't do. Um, Sounds like a but, design problem that, that could potentially, I, I don't know how you'd well, solve if, that, but this, if it's a comfort issue, not a safety issue, is it? Um, yeah, well, we, we, we can't use nylon, though, because nylon isn't UV resistant like polyester is. So we, we have the highest UV factor in the world, obviously, ourselves in Australia. So in our standard, um, we specify that it has to meet UV requirements. If you make a harness in Europe, then you can use nylon. It's a bit comfier and it doesn't have to hit the same UV standard. Um, doesn't so, that create a yeah, risk, that, though, if you're using 
a nylon product in New Zealand and in a harsh UV sun that it just doesn't. It, it doesn't have the same lifespan. Yeah, it, it does. Um, you know, no, no harness is ever made to fail, though. So um, whilst it's not made to our same specifications and it's not ultimately as safe, it's, it's, it's still going to do its job, but it's not made to the New Zealand standard. Um, so it comes down to then the company's, I suppose, decision as to whether they accept the European standard or whether they accept the New Zealand standard. So it's a, um, you know, it's something that we're caught in between. Um, you know, and that's, I suppose it's life to a degree, but there are companies that, um, that see the good side and say, well, I've got the Australian New Zealand standard, we'll have to make it. You know, we have to, have to use these ones. Um, yeah. So. Moving on to just what you've you've mentioned there around COVID nineteen, uh, yep. you, you've got these different industries that you sell into, and you know, recreational tourism and uh, adventure tours is is one area that I would imagine you've noticed a quite a substantial drop off. Uh, how are you going to balance that that drop off with some of the other categories? Um, what are you seeing, and and how are you adapting? Uh, given that we're yep. in a week of three of COVID-19 currently, and there is a little bit of light in the t- end of the tunnel, at least for online sales and being able to operate safely again. Yeah, um, you know, one, one thing that has been, so I suppose, positive over this time is, is despite us telling everybody we're not shipping anything until level three, is, is our websites have continued to get orders. So, um, is that right? That's you know, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, you know, the, the first day back is, is going to be like, it's going to be bonkers. So you're just um, catching up on lost time to actually pick and pack and deliver. Yeah, 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 well, exactly. And, um, you know, so it's, it's going to have a, you know, we're going to be running out like heated chickens, I suppose, which, which should be a great feeling and it's a great, great way to get back. Um, you know, I've been talking to a lot of our customers over the, the past few weeks and, you know, there is there some optimism out there in, in certain industries that, um, you know, they're going, to be, they're going to be fine and they're going to continue on, um, which, you know, which, which is great, but um, obviously the, the likes of adventure tourism, that's going to be quite quite heavily hit. Um, our, our guys in the theatre and rigging industry, um, I really feel for. Um, you know, large large crowds aren't going to be coming back for, for quite a while. So you know, our stage, movie productions, etc. Oh, that, that's all going to be it's all going to be on, on dormant. Um, you know, the world of West, uh, world of world of arts, one of our great supporters, and you know, every year we're we're giving them heaps of harnesses to fly all there. The people around. I mean, that's, that's been cancelled now. Um, you know, so there's, there's going to be this, I suppose, lag in, in terms of until we find the markets that we need to be in. Um, and, you know, what do we do to keep our team busy in, in the meantime? Um, essentially, we're, we're going to be making stock, I suppose, for a few weeks and, until we work that out. Um, we've got plenty of materials. You know, we, we just... We were sort of like in the, I suppose you might call it fortunate position of we had just restocked everything from a really busy summer period. So we had a whole lot of shipments on the water and, um, you know, we've, we've had stuff on the port since, since the lockdown started. Um, it's just starting to come through now. So we've got lots of materials. We've got lots of stock. Um, we've got lots of labour ready to work. Um, it's just a matter of, of how we get people to work. So um, I think like, like a lot of manufacturers, Level three is going to be a challenge for us. Um, we can't have all our staff in the, in the building at the same time. Um, luckily, we are able to move some machines to people's houses, and, and they're happy to have them there. And we're going to have a little bit of work from home. We're going to have a little bit of work at the factory. Um, and you know, somehow we'll just make this work. I suppose. Um, yeah, As it's you, the Kiwi way, isn't it? You know, it's the <laughs> well, and, and the thing I was just picking up on there, Shane, is yeah. as you were saying that, how relaxed and you know, you've got a smile on your face about something that's oh, yeah. that's pretty structural for, for many businesses out there. Mm-hmm. What what keeps you so level headed uh, about um, what we're going through right now? Yeah, uh, I suppose, like, like, like I've told you, I mean, we, we've even we've bought a new building. We, we settle on it in two weeks' time. Um, we, we had the opportunity to, to get out of it at the start of this lockdown, but myself, my team, and my, my fellow shareholder, we, we sat down and we were like, it's not very optimistic, is it? It's, it's not going to help the long-term plan for the company. Let's let's go forth and let's, let's make it happen. You know, we've, we've gone from where we were four years ago to, to where we are now. Um, we know the markets we're good in. We know the markets we're not good in. 
we, we see a lot of opportunities out there where you know we we can make things happen. You know, we, we are, I suppose, to some degree, quite a small, nimble team. There is only ten of us. Um, we can respond to change pretty rapidly. Um, so the glass could be half full, it could be half empty. We're just saying, well, it's half full, isn't it? And um, and you know, it's um, I suppose that's the beauty of being a little bit diversified in your business. Mm, um, definitely, yeah. You know, not not having one big customer, um, you know, we we can sort of, I suppose, create our own destiny and and, and go forward with it. So, so you know, we're um, we're cautiously optimistic. We we don't really know what the the post COVID world's going to look like. Um, you know, there's there's some really really good things happening out there in terms of, of the numbers going down. It looks like this this country might have to be on top of it and, and get this under control. And as long as some form of on the normality returns, then um, yeah, we're we're looking forward to getting back and making stuff, and um, you know we've had a couple of little design things in, in the in the making over this period as well that we're going to launch when we come back. Um, so yeah, it's um, yeah, it's truly courageous yeah. to hear that you're going to go through with the uh, the building uh, acquisition yeah. because uh, many business owners at this time will simply conserve cash and shrink down, uh, and yep. and that's. Uh, many times that actually is the right thing to do because that gets you through, um, you know, sometimes a, a, a tight period. However, and this is, the, I guess, the balance every business is going through. And what you've said is it doesn't necessarily set you up for your long term plan. So it's mm-hmm. being being risk mitigating enough in the short term without completely swapping and shutting down. One thing I've noticed, at least in, in Buy New Zealand Made, is you know, we had the, the same question to ask, which is, you know, what do we do through this period when we're working from home? And and um, with these at Kiwi Original, these were all face to face in the office. And yeah. I thought about it and thought, wow, Kiwis are all going to be at home. There's going to be a lot of negative news go through these news feeds. Why not put some a, a positive story once a week? And then I thought, why does it have yeah, to be yeah, once right. a week? So um, we've gone from once a week to this week I'm doing four. Last week was five. Because there's plenty of good stories out there, and I think this is just mm-hmm. useful to for business owners to tune in to hear, you know, what you're doing and how you're seeing it. Because it helps then uh, you can learn something from peers much better, I believe, than learning from someone who isn't in business right now, you know, like myself. You know, I'm employed for business oh, yeah. NZ. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and definitely, and look, is um, you know, don't don't get me wrong, we're we're not being reckless or anything we we sat down at the start of the lockdown we, we paid every single bill we had we looked at the cash in the bank we, we looked at what we could do we figured out how long we could survive for we ran the worst case scenario and, and we thought you know well let's chip some more money in and let's make it work because we know we've got a great business we had a great business pre-covid so we're going to have an even better business post-covid as far as i'm concerned um you know I, I look at things like google adwords spend at the moment and and the rates are dropping so low that you know it's I say this to you. So much bang for your buck. Why why wouldn't you? One thousand percent. And I, I said to my team um, when I went through the GFC in two thousand and nine, the people stop on the accelerator for advertising. So you get access to the same audience for a third or less. I'm finding with Facebook and Instagram now, our organic reach is two and a half to three hundred percent higher. Because mm-hmm. the ad and marketing uh, content's not out there. So uh, well done for doing it. You'll find then if you can keep your foot on the accelerator with that that marketing spend that when the audience comes back, you'll get an unfair market size of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I also look back. I mean, the other, the other thing I did is I, I talked to Lindsay, the former owner, about the GFC and, and what happened there. And I, I've looked at the figures. I mean, we've, we've got the last 20 years worth of numbers here. And you know there was there was this boost, this this nice little organic boost four or five months after it. Now, albeit we're in a complete different world at the moment, and this is a completely different problem, um, and our markets are being affected a lot differently. But you know you can take some solace in that, and and that gives you that that enthusiasm and, and that positivity, I suppose, to to say, hey, let's let's, let's go with it. So um, exactly, when you know, there's that, volatility, there is opportunity. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know, and that's that's more fun, you know. Why, why be pessimistic and sit at home and you know and, and we'll worry about it? Let's you know let's just go out there and, and just make it happen. Like I say, we're small, we're nimble, we've got a great team. Um, we know we can do it. You know we, we make great products, we have great customer service, 
we have fantastic customers that support us like you would not believe. I mean, we, we've we've got customers out there that are so supportive of New Zealand made. They're like, what else can you make us? Um, you know, and, and now the challenge is back on us to say, well, well, we've come up with this. How about you use this now? Um, so you know, it's um, it's cautiously optimistic that um, yeah, it's going to be some fun times ahead, and you know, we're going to probably have to work harder. Um, but you know, it's that's life, you know. Well, Shane, I really appreciate you sharing your story today on a Kiwi Original. And, you know, out of all our license holders, um, yeah. you're one of the ones that every time I come and visit you, there's always the New Zealand made flag there. So I uh, appreciate seeing it in the in the background yeah. of what I'm assuming is your home office now. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to, to mention before we round off this call? Um, I, I'd just like to say, I suppose we've seen quite vividly that there's a real need for New Zealand manufacturing to to actually survive in, in New Zealand, you know, we we cannot rely on on foreign companies all the time. Um, you know, whether whether it's us us making harnesses or, or someone else making clothing, um, or you know, all these, these other great companies, you know, just do your little bit and just I suppose support New Zealand made because we're all in this together. And you know, as we're showing, we're, we're a team of five million, and we can um, look what we can make happen in four weeks. You know, like. What else can we do when we start supporting each other? So, um, yeah, um, good time to be a New Zealander as far as I'm concerned. I, I like that sentiment. And uh, we've set up a um, shopkiwi.online site so that it makes it easy for New Zealanders to find uh, what's available to buy from New Zealand manufacturers. So if you're not on there, make sure you get Aspiring Safety on there. I will do indeed. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it, Shane. This has been a Kiwi original brought to you by the New Zealand Made team. Thanks for watching. Uh, the New Zealand Made trademark is used by over 1,200 businesses in New Zealand. Uh, the New Zealand Made team licenses that trademark. Check if you're eligible at buynz.org.nz. If you feel that someone should see this, share it with them now. Otherwise, subscribe to youtube.com forward slash buynzmade. We'll see you on the next episode.